Well, wonderful to do this concerto together again after a few years. But there's something really special about this performance, isn't there? Go on, tell everybody. Well, yesterday was the 125th anniversary of the first performance of this concerto, and it was in London, in Queen's Hall, with Leo Stern, who's an Englishman, a soloist. And who conducted? Jack conducting. So why did this happen in London? It was commissioned, I think, by the Royal Philharmonic Society, the same august body that sent Beethoven some money when he was dying. It's great history, that Royal yeah, Philharmonic Society. It does, you're right, absolutely. Well, it's a very special piece, and it's, it's one of the most famous pieces of music, isn't it? It's very loved, and the, one of the reasons is the quality of the inspiration. And that came from him being in America, didn't it? Yes. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of homesickness. He yeah. was missing his native Bohemia hugely. Um, he's, yeah, I mean, it came because he's Dvorak, because he's, he, for me, is the composer who, who's sort of writes folk music, but in symphonic forms. There's some, there's this essential simplicity to his music. And, you know, it's rooted in folk music. He was a, it's a you know, it's, well, outwardly, anyway, a very simple man just loved his simple pleasures and he loved his simple folk music and yet he was master of the large forms as well he was really the first and he sort of and when he went to america he encouraged the americans to use their own music um, you know to, to create their own genres out of which came blues jazz you know everything it comes from the dvorak in a way and he was a great great family man wasn't he and not all the children came with him at the beginning so, and the rest came. How many did he have? Six, was it? Six or seven, I can't seven. remember. Yeah, something like well, that. But they were a real clan, weren't they? They were. And his tenderness towards his children and his wife was terrific. But he loved his wife's sister, didn't he? He loved his wife. Lots of composers fell in love when, with their, or were first in love with their wives' sisters. And Haydn, Mozart, uh, Dvorak, and others. Uh, it's obviously a composer habit. But doesn't the, her death or something? Yes. Well, what happened was he started... I mean, she... I don't know. I haven't read much of her, but um, the letters I wrote are all about money. She writes to them in America, just going right through the family, saying what, how much money she wants for each one. Um, but anyway, he was in love with her. And while he was in America, he started this great cello concerto, which was actually originally inspired by Niag Niagara Falls. He went there. He had this vision which eventually turned into the cello concerto. But while he was in America, he heard that Josefina, his sister-in-law, was very ill. So in the middle of the slow moment, it suddenly goes into the minor, having been in sort of good bohemian G major, goes into G minor, and he quotes a song of his own that she particularly loved. And then he finished the concerto, he came back to Europe, and she died. So he added the coda of the last moment, again quoting the same song, and as really as a tribute to her. It's funny because I think there, there are two very famous um, codas to cello concertos, the Elgar and Dvorak, and they're both heart-rendingly beautiful, but you can sort of tell that the Elgar's been planned from the beginning, whereas Dvorak's definitely, you can feel it's tacked on. It doesn't make it any less moving. In fact, his original ending, I think, wouldn't have worked. He, I've recorded it, but it doesn't work. He would have revised it. But I don't think he would have put that huge, lyrical, tragic coda. And it changes the whole aftertaste of the piece really. It does doesn't it mm. and even not necessarily understanding how the music came to be as it is it still creates an extraordinary atmosphere yeah. in the room That's doesn't gorgeous. it it's, it's just so beautiful yeah. See, time seems to stand still and he summons the huge amounts of energy for the end doesn't he yeah um, stormy ending stormy cool. ending yeah Yes. Well, uh, it'll be lovely to do it, and the orchestra plays so beautifully. They, they? do, and the soloists and the winds, because it's really, as, I, as we said yesterday, chamber music on a large scale. Yes. First flute is very important, the first clarinet's very important, oboe, horn, bassoons, they all have, even the triangle has its moments, and solo violin, and everything. It's really, it's not just cello with orchestra, it's, it's, it's Yeah, it's a community, musical community. Yeah. Well, that sense of community, I might hazard, infects the other Dvorak piece we're going to play in this concert. A work that I think is properly titled The Wild Dove. Many people refer to it as The Wood Dove, but I think The Wild Dove is probably right. And it's one of the, the symphonic poems that he wrote at the end of his life, mastering the orchestra in the most extraordinary way. And he wanted to write something really Czech uh, that came from the Czech background, the Czech cultural legacy. 
And uh, the other ones are like the, the water nymph, the golden spinning wheel, the noonday witch, and together they make the most wonderful group of symphonic poems. The story of this one is very simple and extremely poignant. A young girl is unhappily married to such an extent that she poisons her husband and tries to get away with it. The music starts with this long, very elegiac funeral march. But into this sadness comes a new colour, a new flirtatious lightness. Her eyes are already taken by another boy in the village and we see him coming from afar. You hear the sound of the three trumpets playing very far in the distance and trying to summon her to dance. And to begin with, she says, no, no. But gradually she agrees and the music explodes into what is a huli, I mean, a Czech marriage feast. And this dance goes on and on and it's very wild and very uninhibited. Perhaps something that she lacked in, in her first wedding. And gradually night falls and everybody goes off home quietly. And the scene changes to the graveyard of the local church where her husband, her first husband, is now buried. And in a tree over the grave, a wild dove sits and coos and makes this strange song, haunting song. Dvořák has, has managed to summon up an extraordinarily unexpected effect using the orchestra, but making them do things in harmonies that are completely unexpected, using instruments, the very high harp notes, for instance. And this cooing, this gentle singing of the wild dove plays on her mind. She hears it from her own bedroom. And her sense of guilt as having destroyed her first husband grows and grows. And each time the bird sings, the music in between shows us her neurosis, shows us her guilt getting larger and larger. And in the end, she can't bear it. And she jumps from a bridge and commits suicide into the water. Dvořák was obviously didn't want to finish it in a totally tragic way. And the ending of the piece is extremely unexpected and beautiful. The, 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 the sound of the bird gradually, gradually softens and the orchestra seems to bless her, seems to place a blessing on what has happened. And the work ends in an, in an uncomfortable but definite piece. It's a very remarkable work and it should be, I think, much better known than it is. But should you bless a woman who's poisoned her husband? It sounds immoral to me. Well, should you put a warning? Perhaps, but I think he may not have intended it for her, if you like, but over the story, or for us, or something. He or tries husband. to bring first a benediction. Husband. Her first husband, yeah, perhaps he blesses him. A similar parallel of human tussling and misunderstandings and misapprehensions comes in Janáček's great opera, Yenufa. And one of the things that pieces this program together is the fact that Janáček conducted the world premiere of The Wild Dove. So we're going to start the concert tonight with the short piece of music that he originally imagined would be the beginning, the overture, to Yenufa, one of his earliest operas and one of his first great successes. Yenufa, as many people will remember, is set in a, in a Czech country village where Yenufa is loved by two people. And Lhatsa, the man who really in the end gets her, is an extraordinary character full of his own insecurities and his hot-headed passion, his own arrogance, his own youthful impetuosity. Yennefer, meanwhile, has a quiet strength that draws him to her. And the tussle between these two personalities, which is so difficult throughout this opera, is of course wonderful to portray in music. It's wonderful to find the daredevil, the, the spirited young man, and then the contrasted, gentle, romantic, feminine, delicate um, Yenufa's music. And in this short little piece, which is not at all well known, but is a, a little masterpiece, Janacek tries to get us ready for what would have been the opera. The reason it isn't is quite interesting. He wrote it and perhaps planned some of the opera, but then he needed to write other pieces. People asked him, he needed to earn money, and he turned away from writing the opera. When he came back to it 18 months, two years later, he looked at this overture and had a completely different idea for how this opera might start. It doesn't start with an overture, it starts with a, a prelude that goes straight into the action in Act One, as if it's always been going on and the curtain just happens to rise. So he discarded this piece and thankfully 
many people, but particularly Sir Charles McCarris, uh, towards the end of his life, made sure that we had a wonderful performing edition of it. And that's what we're going to play tonight, and I'm sure we will be introducing this great music to more and more people. And how does the story of Yennefer end? Yennefer becomes pregnant. How? Um, by one of her boyfriends. And the woman who looks after her, the Kostelnitschka, decides once the baby is born that the only way to save her dignity and her honor in such a rural, tightly closed um, community is to take the baby away and drown it. And her determination to do that is the climax of the second act. And she has to explain to Yennefer that while she's been asleep and while she was ill and she was drugged or something like that, the baby died, had a fever and died. And so Yennefer is beside herself. But then in the third act, in front of the entire village, somebody in the beginnings of spring, the ice melts and the dead body of the child is Perfect. revealed. So we've got a program of dead sister-in-laws with whom composers were sort of illegally in love and then a husband poisoned, woman throwing herself into a lake, baby sort of drowned. It's going to be a fun concert. Well, music has the ability, doesn't it, to rise above this and yes. find radiance and a positive energy in a lot of the tragic situations You're of our right. lives. It's one of its greatest gifts. And these three works in their different ways are wonderful examples of the power of music to transcend the difficulties of life.